do one hyphen heaven.org and you click on how to succeed at court and you go down to the link executor office you will now see that there are two more instruments that have been added the decree of nullity and the revocation of power of attorney now I just ask you to go and have a look so that you can get that link while I give some background before we go through those documents. That is one-heaven.org, how to succeed at court, to click on the Office of Executor link, Executor Office link I should say, and you'll see that there are two new documents, Decree of Nullity and the Revocation of Power of Attorney. But before we get into that, Let's talk about some of the information that's come in the last week that reinforces the strength. Now I've shared with you the bedrock foundation that we assert is the absolute fact that every single court action is the sacrament of penance, a purely ecclesiastical act in three parts. And that every instrument that is issued from court, indeed, Every instrument that's issued from a bank, in fact, is an indulgence. Now let's add some flesh to that before we get to these documents. In Shakespeare, one of the quotes is, all the world is a stage. And if we look at the three parts, and we look at the worship of the number three in their system, the concept of trinity, the concept of three, is an essential component in their system. Now one way to view court matter is like a play is not their words that the judges the lawyers and members of the bar describe that they are practicing the law they are not enforcing the law or involving the law they're practicing the law and one might describe them as actors and one might even describe the bar guild in one perverse manner as a play company a company that's putting on theatrical events now, in a sense, that is, is in fact exactly how they view themselves. And a court case is three acts of a play. Act one, and consider the role of the executor as the protagonist, the hero. In act one, it is the prosecutor, the prosecutus, the one standing in our own skin, claiming powers of attorney and guardianship to pretend and, and make the accusation as if they were us. Act 1. Act 2, the judge is the executor. And at that point is where to confirm and perfect the confession. And Act 3, the guilty is the executor. It's when they want us to be the executor. Well, let's use some other language. Act 1 is the indictment. Act 2 is the hearing and trial, and Act 3 is the sentencing. So hopefully this makes clear one aspect and confusion about who is the executor and what's going on. In that, the executor role shifts around the court in order to perfect the sacrament of penance. Well, let's describe the sacrament of penance. The sacrament of penance in three parts. The accusation, the first part. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. The confession, this is my confession. Absolution, satisfaction. You're forgiven of your sins. Three parts, Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. Indictment, hearing, sentencing. Let's look at the three in another manner. Problem, reaction, solution. Or premise, argument, conclusion. So it's all there. It's all clear. Hopefully we see the framework now, the framework of argument, the framework of ecclesiastical law, the framework of foundation now, we should view it with certainty. Now we can deal with the aspect of what is going on in terms of these claimed powers to usurp the role of executor as we deal with the level above the sacrament of penance when we're dealing with trust law. So let's look at the system of control and guardianship 
which we have discussed generally, but we haven't discussed, I think, nearly enough. And this is, again, an element, an important element of information that's come through. Now, the role of guardian in the pronouncement of restitutum that is part of the new ecclesiastical process is highlighted as an extremely important role. And the role of the guardian is, in fact, an extraordinarily powerful role. The role of the guardian, when it is in place, presumes that the other party is the child, is the minor. So how do they get this guardianship role and what's involved? Well, it turns out that in their system, they put in place a historical bedrock and they put in place a contemporary bedrock of being able to assume that all of us are under guardianship, all of us, and it's an argument. So I'll get to the modern use of it in a moment, but let's talk about the historical element. Now, if I say to the word council, most people would say, well, council being a, a local municipal body, and, that, and they'd be right. When you look at the history of council, the word council, by the way, means committee, and it comes from the word uh, comitatus, uh, sorry, committee, I apologise, it doesn't come, it comes comitere, county comes from comitatus, but a council is a committee, and it is an institution administered by a committee established by trust for the care, administration, education of minors, infirm, lunatics and incompetent who have been committed to its care. We find council is introduced towards the end of the 19th century, specifically from the year 1871, an extraordinarily important year, not least for the fact that it's a year that the District of Columbia, as a CQV model, gets uh, born, reborn. It's also the year we see extraordinary work in creating the local government model around the world where powers are transferred from some of the most senior bodies of government to these local government bodies and shires become shire councils and boroughs become borough councils and towns become town councils. And we see the merging of the poor laws and other laws into the concept of health and vital statistics. Yep, 1871 is when we see all the morphing of all these powers, especially the idea of the SESTA-KV or the CQV, sometimes known as the Fides Commissari or the Foreign Scientists Trusts, being merged into vital statistics, a subsidiary of health. So health and councils and local government all comes in in 1871. Now what is significant about this? What's significant is that under the council model, the unit of the community then becomes a ward, a W-A-R-D, a ward. And when I say the word ward, what instinctively do you think of? I hope you think of a hospital, because that's exactly the connection with a ward. And when I say the word hospital, what many don't immediately remember is that a hospital is a military institution. It is a military institution, the same as a county, comitatus, which I made the mistake before, is a company. And when counties were formed in 1540, they were headed by a Lord Lieutenant. It is a military company, a plantation of prisoners of occupied territory under the mob. But the creation in 1871 of wards is an entirely different model. It is the creation of an administrative unit of the population as if we are all patients, or the word that they used to describe patients in 1871, they described them as 
residence. The origin of residence in 1971. Patients of a hospital, of an institution, because we are invalid. Not invalid, well, we are considered invalid, but we are invalid. We are infirm. We are considered one of two types of mind. We are either an idiot or a lunatic. Let's define an idiot or a lunatic. If we are considered an idiot, then we have no compass mentis, we have no sound mind, and we perform our life happily believing that the world is lovely, that these people do the right thing for us, that all this stuff people talk about is uh, rubbish and conspiracy, and they're called idiots. Legally, they're called idiots under the system. And that's unfortunately exactly what they are, idiots. They don't want to know, they don't care to know, just give them the minimum that they're happy with and they will live life happily. That's one group. The other group are lunatics. And lunatics are different to idiots by having bouts of intellect, having bouts of competence. They almost get it right. They go to court, they stand up, they behave honorably, but whoop, they can't help themselves. They shout out or they say it's all rubbish or instead of staying the, the path, they give up and say there is no remedy. They, they show periods of competence, periods of honour, periods of, of uh, standing their ground, and then they crumble. They fall back to being idiots again. And they're lunatics. And when people come to court and they appear to be lunatics, of course, the first thing the court will do as a guardian is seek a psych eval. Of course, there's a third group that sit outside of that. That's the people in the know that are neither idiots nor lunatics. And they are the guardians. So in 1871, they created this concept that we have never left the hospital. We've never left the hospital. We are outpatients of the hospital. We were born... We are registered, but I bet you, have you ever seen a paper when you were born to prove that you were discharged from the hospital? Your mother might have been discharged, but were you discharged? I doubt you'd find any document to say that a baby is discharged from a hospital. And to make matters worse, if I want to prove that you are still a patient an outpatient of the hospital, let's see if you're carrying around your patient identification. Now, if you live in America, your patient identification is your SS number. Do you have an SS number, an SSN? If you do, then you're a patient. If you live in Australia, do you have a Medicare card? If you do, you're a patient. If you live in England, you have an NHS card, well, you're a patient. In their system, the only constant identifier you hold from birth to death is a unique identifier issued through the hospital identifying you as a patient that has never been discharged. Now, what is the importance of this system and why go to the extent of creating this? Because... One of the things you always find with information like this is the credibility factor. Why would they do this? What's the benefit to them? Well, here's the benefit. If you are a patient considered either an idiot or a lunatic, does the guardian have any requirement to tell you the truth, to show you the operations of the administration? to divulge anything to you? No. In fact, if you are considered legally and lawfully a patient of a mental institution, then the powers that be have and can argue that they have a moral and a legal 
obligation 